welcome Nina and Stacy. to be Mike because I'm so small behind the podium, but um, thank you, Bob, for inviting us to be here. It's been, it's um, exciting to be amongst folks that are thinking about big ideas and um, being really honest about the discussion, um, getting me out here. So we're actually based in California as a company in Sonoma, California, and I live currently in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, just to further confuse folks. Um, but since I've been out here, I've had just an opportunity over the last four or five days to see a lot of facilities, to engage in these kind of meetings, and I'm feeling a little bit more hope. Um, if Patty were also here, she would um, be, well, we'd be trying to talk her off the cliff. She's really saying we're, we're in a serious crisis mode right now. Um, so I'm excited to be here and to continue to elevate the discussion right now. Um, I was going to talk originally more from an inspirational standpoint um, in looking at the ways that we are trying to innovate using um, to maximize recovery of material using um, alternative networks outside of the regular hauling and MRF industry. Um, and since uh, Bob asked me to talk, things have gotten more serious in terms of the market. I'm still going to pepper in some uh, Einstein quotes, which it's been great that we've already heard a lot and, and mentioned of biomimicry earlier today from Scott, um, but to look deep into the nature and you will understand everything better. I've been trying to really, as things are getting much more difficult in the 17 years that I've been working in plastic recycling, step back to basics and really think about the questions that we're asking. And particularly in a, in a setting like this, looking at um, having a big conversation around it, finding the right question. Um, on. Friday, um, Chad Joden, our newest uh, partner in more recycling, we attended the Haas Berkeley School of Business, uh, Kimberly Clark, with these two ladies over here, Berkeley students, um, hosted by Kimberly Clark at the Center for Responsible Business. And it was also, it was a, kind of a similar group in terms of we have a problem, let's not just talk about, well, how are we going to educate and how are we going to do a little bit here and there, but dive right into the really difficult questions. And another Einstein quote came up that seemed particularly helpful. Um, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So here's just a peek into the room. Um, we we're in the innovation lab at Berkeley, and I was so pleased with the six or seven groups that really big uh, ideas came out of that. And, and I felt like it wasn't just a let's talk about it and then we're going to have another meeting, but I felt a bit of hope about it. So, um, since I am shifting from the original plan that I had with my talk, since we we're starting to get some new data in on a study that I'll talk a little bit more about, and I've been asked by some folks across the industry to work on more of a decision model to get, get at the core of the question of how do we really specifically drive demand for plastics. I want you to think about these three potential drivers to stimulate in-market demand, and I want you to think about which one you'd be willing to put your money on from a cost-effective standpoint. Not just effective, but cost-effective. So thinking about the likelihood of it actually happening, thinking about the, the risk of failure, so would you focus on number one, and you don't have to answer it now, but at the very end I'm going to ask these, on reducing the cost, uh, increasing efficiency, as we talked about, reducing the, the cost of PCR to make it more competitive with Virgin, so more of the supply side. Would you focus on really uh, assuming that the private sector is going to step up and there, there's going to be continued pressure, and we're going to go back to times maybe in the early 90s when companies like Dow and Exxon invested in products that solve some of the, the challenges with plastic products, such as plastic bags? Um, or are we going to look at policy that maybe perhaps levels the playing field and rewards companies that achieve sustainable materials management goals around use of PCR? So think about which one of those three you would really be willing to put your money on. But I'm going to then now kind of switch gears. And as a company, our job is to track information and make it as available and approachable to as many people as we can to help facilitate better decisions. So, um, well, just a little bit more on the, the nature and biomimicry to 
make us feel a little bit better. Um, I think it's been said maybe seven times now, but th that we should not have waste. And so more of the question is, if we're so good at pumping products from the heart of manufacturing out into the body that we use material, we are so good at it. You look at Amazon and all the efficiencies and the um, just time uh, gains that we've seen in pushing materials out so very quickly. Why can't we reabsorb these materials? There, I think that question of why is, has got to be further um, unwrapped. So just a, a cute thing from the biomimicry. I think it was Scott that mentioned the biomimicry organization earlier today. The hours of stop traffic for ants as they're moving such complex, uh, you know, so many little bits all together in such fast order. Zero hours wasted in traffic, and particularly being in L.A., over the last couple of days in traffic, 70 million hours wasted just in the Netherlands last year, just sitting in traffic. I mean, we absolutely should be doing better than this. So um, to kind of pull off some of the stuff that we track, we just, Stacey and I put together some data sets that hopefully will shed some light and continue to elevate the discussion about where we are. And if I were to pick a couple headlines right now, um, you know, from if more recycling, we're, we're sharing some of the news. You know, I, I haven't explained, but some of the stuff that we do as a company is track the annual recycling um, for the various plastic commodities. Um, and so we can, Stacey's going to go into this, but we've been growing how much material we collect for recycling, and it's, the growth has been primarily in domestic markets. We've actually seen a decline um, in what's going export. We don't have enough demand or reclamation capacity for some commodities, which has been okay when there's been tremendous demand from China. But as we haven't talked a whole lot about the national sword, the next policy in China is, is tightening up that um, demand. And then what's really interesting is, is relating all of this information back to California. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy to go into a little bit more, and then I'll come back. Have to increase the microphone here a little bit. <laughs> uh, thanks for having us. We're excited to be here and share in the conversation. So um, as Nina suggested, we just want to share some of the information that helps us kind of dive into how do we answer some of these questions and get to where we're um, making more of an effective difference. Um, so I just wanted to share with you, give you guys some context as we're thinking about this. We, as Nina mentioned, we track annually how much plastic's being recycled in the U.S. And I thought this was, um, would help, too, just to give some context, to of what we have tracked that's recycled in 2015. Um, and this is a minimum. It's a voluntary survey, um, but we get a pretty good response rate. But of that, 34% of it's PET bottles and 22% of it is HDP bottles. And then you have non-bottle rigid, which is a combination of stuff coming out of the household, but also commercial, um, so crates and um, pallets and buckets and things like that. Same thing with film, 23%, but a portion of that's commercial as well as um, retail bags and the overwrap over your toilet paper and all of those things. So. Um, so just to give, oops, oh, did that not get added in? Okay. I wanted to give a little bit of um, extra information from a generation standpoint. Um, so where PT bottles and HDP bottles are making up about 56% of um, what we document as recycled, when you look at um, the generation by category that the EPA puts out, um, so 43% of overall um, is packaging and containers, right? And then you have non-durable goods, 21%, that's your hangers, things like that. Um, and then durable goods is 36%. So going back to that 43%, um, when you look at the breakout of packaging, PT bottles is only 20% of that, and HDP bottles is 12%, and non-bottle rigids 40%, and film is 28%. So here you have already PT this, this focus on PT and HDP bottles, which we have a great infrastructure for collecting, but we already are just doing so much better job with PT and HDP bottles, and there is all this non-bottle rigid material and film material just not being addressed, but growing <laughs> by the minute um, in packaging, where you have a lot less um, going into blow molded material um, 
and we're going to pouches, and people brought these things up, pouches and things like that. Um, so there's, it's right for us to do more in that area. Um, is it here or here? Oh, here we go, okay. So Nina mentioned this, the growth over time of the material recovered domestically. So we have seen an increase, obviously, of materials recycled, um, but when you look at it from a recycling rate standpoint, of course, as everybody mentioned, there's an increase in plastics being used. So we're, we're doing, you know, we're, we're making things happen, but we're not making enough happen. But one nice thing about it is we are, I'm going to be pressing this right. Imagine a arrow going up across the um, top bars there. Do it again. Okay. Okay. Help, yeah, help me out. Do it for me. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there has been an increase in the amount of material being recovered domestic, reclaimed domestically. And if you want to hit that again, um, the export has, uh, it's decreased, but it's mostly kind of flattened out where the increases in our recycling have been mostly domestic. We still have a dependence on the export market um, nationally for sure. Um, and if you, oops, I guess it is working for me, okay. And then if you look at the capacity for handling materials, again, looking back at our major categories here, PET bottles, HDP bottles, you can see the blue bar shows the capacity um, in the US to handle that material. And we're collecting less than we have capacity for. That, that's good in some ways because we can, we have the capacity to process it here given there's the in-market demand to pull that through. Um, but then where you look at non-bottle rigid and film, you see we, have, we don't have enough capacity here to handle the material, just the material we've documented <laughs> that's being recycled. So there's probably more out there and there's even more going into um, the landfill for sure. And that's all on the rise, as I mentioned. Um, so this just gives you a snapshot of what's been, this is 2015, so PET bottles actually, in uh, looking back to 2009, used to be at more of a 50, I think there was a 52% um, rate going overseas. And I remember this, there was all of this focus on what are we gonna do, we have all this capacity. And that's really gotten to where it's much more of it staying domestic, which is a great, um, great, because we have the capacity for it. HDP always has, a, has had a very strong um, domestic market, and it was a little bit higher if you look back to 2009, but more kind of in the 20%, 16, 15, somewhere around there. But with non-bottle rigid, still 34% is going um, export, and that was a little bit higher, more into the high 40s and 50s before the green fence. Um, but it's not going down the same way the other ones were. And the biggest thing there is most of the domestic capacity for non-bottle rigid is for segregated materials. Most of what is going export is all mixed rigid. Some of that material that's sitting in those containers on the dock um, is definitely that material. And then film has always kind of had a high 50s um, going export, and that's maintaining. Um, the problem is that... Um, the export market is going away, <laughs> you know what I mean? That not only did we have the green fence come through, but now there's the new national sword like Nina mentioned, and the, the worst of it hasn't hit. They're still gonna come out with a further list, um, and even beyond plastic, like, and when we're talking about infrastructure in general and the needs for it, mixed paper is gonna be hit pretty hard. And so um, when we look at, um, looking at California specifically, um, in North America, and this is, there's some other intermediate reclaimers and things in here as well, but as you can see, most of the domestic infrastructure is on the East Coast, not on the West Coast, so more of California's material goes export. 
So we're in even more of a crisis than um, the rest of the country in some ways because there's not um, the facilities to take this material. So um, this is kind of a spreckling of the MRFs throughout the um, state. And as you, you can see a small little orange dot there down at the very bottom, and that's a secondary MRF um, facility that will basically take the mixed um, material, mostly the residual coming off the container line, but they can also take the mixed bales that, again, now can't go anywhere. Um, and they then can further um, process what is this material, as well as the residual, which would include the paper and things, as well as the polystyrene. And then they're creating a segregated resin material that has the best chance for finding a home domestically. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we're going to have to have the end markets <laughs> to pull that all through. But the first step from an infrastructure standpoint is at least being able to sort that material so that somebody that can take it and does have the demand for it can take it here domestically. Because again, the export market is just going to continue to get worse sooner, I think, than some people realize that it would. Um, and so Nina is going to talk more now about the end market piece of things. Now that we're all a little more depressed, I was feeling more optimistic, but uh, let's see. And this, I think, is kind of um, to be, we, we definitely, I think, in this room understand that there's no going back from use of plastics. I confess, when I started with more recycling in 2000, and I was you know, pretty new out of college, I was extremely anti-plastic. Um, and I, when I look at what I've learned over the years going through grad school at, at Duke and really studying the trade-offs and, and now looking at things like the global movement of material and how many m more people, there's no turning back from using plastic. But that doesn't give us the liberty of just not finding immediate solutions right now. And I, I liked what Doug said earlier about we don't immediately see the impacts of, of greenhouse gas, of CO2, but we see and feel, and it affects our quality of life immediately in terms of pollution from plastic. But here's a quote that I think is extremely, I mean, a, a fact that is something that I, I try to really keep in mind when I'm like, oh, plastic, other materials. Right now in the US, for the to get um, groceries to the table, just groceries, not all goods, we consume more than 10% of our, our fossil resources just the movement of just that material. And I can't remember who, I think it might have been Scott earlier that said we, and this is a well-known figure, we waste more than 40% of the food. So again, in terms of looking at life cycle, we have to continue to improve what we're um, keeping in terms of food waste and, and not wasting all that upstream production. Um, but on the other hand, and, and so the plastics play a particularly important role in that. So, more recycling. We have to recycle more of this material, but the golden question is how? We have to look at what, what's not working. Economics work when all the market drivers are in place. Um, and then we have a lot of critical tools that we're going to continue to support in terms of facilitating that connection between suppliers and, and markets for material and really tracking the availability of recycling and what the infrastructure is. Um, this is a new tool that's coming out. It's an interactive value chain case study. Originally, we were creating it because we wanted to show how material flows through the system and really elevate, kind of spotlight the companies that are doing a great job in terms of education, collection, and, and filling that space around efficient movement of material. And as the market shifted, we're really zeroing in on who are the companies out there that have been able to innovate, you know, particularly the companies that, that Tamsin's company is able to um, provide material to. Let's spotlight those companies. Let's use those market forces to, to create um, more demand. Um, because one of the groups, as um, Bob mentioned, that I work with is the Flexible Film Recycling Group, and I'm going to be heading to D.C. Um, tomorrow to, to talk with that group that has a goal of getting to 2 billion pounds by 2020 for film. And we're you know, moving in a really, uh, there's a lot of momentum, a lot of community engagement. We have a, a tool that's also going to be coming out to, to make it more automated in terms of making uh, 
recycling coordinators, uh, giving them the tools more easily to pull them through how to handle this material more responsibly in the commercial sector for residents. So all these things are moving on the supply side of the equation. Um, and terminology, again, really moving towards improving the quality. But finally, we are really getting more serious. And, and the group that I work with through the American Chemistry Council, the APR, Association of Plastic Recyclers, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, um, provided some funding for us to do an industry-wide study of what is the true depth of market. So we're not talking in theoretical, but what truly is the state of demand for five different resins, and really looking at what, how, where are the gaps between the supply of material right now in terms of PCR and the spec at what quality versus the gap between the potential demand for this material so we can start having more honest discussions. So those results are, are going to be coming out fairly soon. So I'm glad that we're finally having these honest conversations within the resin companies, within brand companies. We definitely need a lot more at the table. But with you guys in the room, since this is supposed to be a discussion, I wanted to go ahead and put that question back to you guys. I mentioned the three different the three different uh, potential drivers, and this is narrowed down from, I think, we started with maybe 28 different potential drivers, and we've tried to really narrow into what are the most cost-effective uh, potential drivers to stimulate in-market demand. So for the, the first one is focus on reducing cost, increasing efficiency. The second one is um, putting more pressure to, to really get the private sector to invest in new markets for PCR. And the third one is policy, rewarding companies for use of PCR through, um, through actual policy. So let's go back to the first one. Raise your hand if you want to, through cost of, if you're going to put your money on something, would you put it on the first one? And the second one, raise your hand if you would like to see it happen in the um, private sector. And the third one, through policy. Okay, thank you guys. And as I'm not, not sure if I mentioned, so what we're, in, we're evaluating this using MOTA, multi attribute um, objective decision analysis. So we're going to be evaluating this by putting weights on the various value measures and measuring the different drivers based on effectiveness, the time it takes, um, the risk of failure, and cost. And then we'll do a, a cost benefit um, comparison of that. We did a really quick, um, just threw in some numbers Well, I was trying to watch the Kentucky Derby on Saturday. <laughs> so I'm going to now go back and really, we're going to keep drilling into the accuracy of this information and incorporate some of your input so we can go back and start narrowing in on not, not what's easy to get to the next step, but really, as Ayn said, said, focusing in on the question. Um, I think that's it. I, I just, oh, and I want to encourage you, I know you guys have a lot of good ideas and um, big ideas, so I've only mentioned three of the potential drivers. Tamson mentioned markers on plastic. I think that's a huge one. Again, that goes back to a supply thing, but it's a really important piece. So I'd love to capture more ideas up on the, the flip chart that I could incorporate into this as we go forward. So please, please, at the break or at the end, please add some more ideas. <laughs>